Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Daryl Hornick Becker, and I am a policy associate at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Joining me on this webinar is my colleague, uh, CCC data analyst Sophia Halkidis. And we also have our colleague, Carlos Rosales, um, helping us with the chat and the Zoom. A little bit of housekeeping just to start is that we have everyone on mute right now, but we'll hopefully be able to unmute you at the end if you have any questions you want to say out loud. Any questions you have during the webinar, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we are going to answer them as best we can at the end. And if also you're experiencing any issues, if there are any technological issues, if you can't hear us, please make sure to let us know and Carlos will be monitoring the chat to make sure that those things get settled as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Today, our webinar is on remote learning and the city's policies and student needs as they've transitioned to remote learning. A little bit of agenda for what we're going to talk about today. So we'll start with what the transition to remote learning actually looked like and the things that the Department of Education, the city had to do to quickly ramp up this period of remote learning. We'll talk about some updates since that transition and some ongoing issues we're dealing with, of which there's many and there probably are many we won't get to today. We'll talk about some budget cuts which have happened, which pertain to the Department of Education and can affect how we encounter school in the fall and how students recover from this period of remote learning. And then again, we'll turn that into what school in the fall could possibly look like. And we'll end with some advocacy things that CCC has been engaging in that possibly you guys could engage in. And, and then we'll have a question period. So to start, just a history here. Uh, on March 16th, as the COVID-19 pandemic and the scope and scale of it became clear, the D we announced that they'd be closing public schools. Now they didn't start remote learning that day. Schools, staff, teachers, and students had about a week to ramp up. Uh, that's when schools and staff really started to working, working towards a remote platform as to what they could do. And then the Monday following March 20th is when remote classes actually began. Now, when they started remote learning, it was unclear how long it would last. It was really thought to be possibly a temporary thing. There, it was said that it would start and then possibly go through spring break and maybe end when students would be scheduled to return from spring break around April 20th. As we all know, that quickly became unrealistic. And so on May 1st, or around May 1st, because there was some back and forth, the governor of New York announced that all New York schools would be closed at the end of the year. And so everything that we've done for remote learning would continue the rest of the school year. So when the DOE realized that they would have to transition 1.1 million school children of New York City, over 70,000 teachers, 1,800 schools, the largest school system in the country, to remote, it, there were a lot of steps to be taken. So the most important step, possibly, is getting students the devices that they need to actually learn. And so delivering students devices was one of the biggest things that that they engaged in first. So families who needed devices were able to request them online if they didn't have one already. In terms of how many devices the DOE would actually need to get to students who didn't already have them, the number was unclear, but they estimated that there would be around 300,000 students. And they estimated that from a survey of principals and schools asked them who, how many devices they think they would need. So they estimated that they would have to probably distribute around 300,000 devices to start. Now, in terms of that delivery, how it actually happened, most schools have some inventory of laptops that they use for when there's not remote learning, for in-classroom learning, for applications, for, for computer science. And so schools first delivered their inventory of, of DOE-owned laptops. And then following that, the DOE central office delivered data-enabled iPads. They procured those data-enabled iPads through emergency contracts and also donations, largely from Apple. Um, but these were iPads that were delivered that already had internet, internet access built into them in terms of their that, why they were data enabled. How they distributed those were, uh, was, was a, a built-in distribution system. So they started to prioritize certain groups to, in terms of how they assess need. That started with students in temporary housing. So students in emergency shelters, students in youth shelters, students not in shelters but who are temporarily housed as in students who are doubled up. Um, or students in any other kind of shelter, students living in hotels, students with no housing at all, all those students were in their prioritized group. And we'll talk a lot more about those students later, um, as well as students who are in foster care. So that was their first priority in terms of getting devices to students. Following 
their priority of those students, notice not, I didn't say following distribution to every student who needed one, but following that priority, they then distribute it to high school students, to older students who would probably have relied the most on devices for getting their assignments done, including multilingual learner students or students in immigrant families, students with disabilities, and then students who live in public housing. So you saw the DOE try to distribute these devices in some type of uh, sense of who needs them most and when they can get them. Now, they've continued to, do it, to deliver those devices and they've tried to expedite those that deliver as much as possible. As of May 27th, this was at a hearing, the DOE said that they delivered 290,000 devices so far, and they estimate, based off their original estimate, that 10,000 are still needed. Now, again, that is based off the DOE's original estimate of 300,000, and so it's hard to say actually how many devices are still needed, how many students out there are sitting there without a device or without a reliable device to actually engage in the classroom. But according to the DOE's original estimate and what they've delivered, they think that those, there, there's around 10,000 students. And this gets to a point that I, I wanted to mention at the beginning, which is that a, the, a lot of this webinar, like the information I just mentioned, is not going to be the most accurate, or I would say the most up-to-date reliable data points only because we don't have them for this period of remote learning. Usually in these data policy webinars that we like to give at CCC, we like to give a lot of numbers and facts showing you the data that informs our policy and advocacy. And in terms of this period of remote learning, we just don't have that. There's just, there aren't a lot of measurements of educational progress, of academic measurements, of attendance, which we'll talk about, of instruction. A lot of what we're relying on is things from news articles. Um, this I mentioned is from a council testimony that DOE officials were, were at and on record. And so this is the best we can do. It's really, we're condensing information to try to give to you, but in a lot of areas, we are just like you and we are, are learning things as they happen. And I, and I think that myself and Sophia can speak to this as well. What we anticipate is that eventually we're gonna have some data come out that will show us the actual scope of this distance learning period in terms of who it reached and who it didn't, who engaged and who couldn't. Um, but a lot of these things today are going to be what we know and what we don't know. So following, not following, but at the same time as device delivery, the DOE prioritized these pop-up centers that were going to provide some in-person settings where students could learn. So while the 1.1 million children were moved to learn remote, they still wanted to re reserve some spaces that could, students could learn in person. The reason for that is because these were temporary supervision locations created to serve the children of essential workers. The idea being that we couldn't have our hospitals fully staffed, we couldn't have our first responders fully staffed, the things that we need to get us through the pandemic, if those kids were going to be home all day remote learning. So they created these centers meant to serve those essential workers. They quickly expanded that essential workforce as the definitions of who were essential workers also expanded so that if you were required to go to work all day, hopefully you could bring your child to one of these regional enrichment centers across the city. And so those essential workers, in addition to healthcare workers, first responders like NYPD, FDNY, and transit workers, were then soon expanded to include all restaurant workers, grocery employees, all delivery workers, uh, pharmacy workers, and also a lot of public agency staff at different government offices who are also required to be working and working in the field. And so the idea was that these would help those people return to work and or still go to work and serve their kids. The regional enrichment centers um, were designed to serve all grades, that's 3K, right, the lowest level of pre-K the DOE offers on through 12th grade. Um, and then some of the regional enrichment centers were specifically for early, for infants and toddlers and students in early childhood education settings. And so those were infants and toddlers from six months on up to pre-K could also attend in case there were really young kids and they didn't want them to be in the same settings as, as students 3K through 12. The centers were open all day. So they're open for pick up and drop off 7.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And the idea of the centers was it provides children with a structured environment to do remote learning. So that's important. They're not in classes, but they're doing remote learning, but in, in classrooms with guidance. Um, and then that is could that usually is part of the day in the schedules of the remote of the regional entrance centers or RECs as we call them, followed by usually there's arts opportunities, there's music opportunities, there's physical activities that they could engage in, and there's three hot meals offered at these locations to these students. And we'll talk about how, how the DOE fed all their students shortly. Now, in terms of the number of RECs, again, there was a lot of estimations as to how many they would need and how many students that they would want to serve with them. They started with around 70 regional enrichment centers 
um, but they quickly reduced and condensed them due to low enrollment. They weren't getting the enrollment they wanted to see, um, possibly because parents just didn't feel safe bringing their kid to somewhere in person. They closed 23 of the regional Richmond centers at the end of March, and we believe there's 53 as of May 22nd. There could be a, uh, even less from then, probably haven't opened up more, but there's probably still around 50 uh, currently in operation. Now, the original capacity for all the recs was close to 40,000 students. That's what they estimated they would serve. But again, enrollment was a lot lower. We still don't know exactly how many students they're enrolling, but we estimate it's probably around 9,000 students or higher. We heard it was around 8,000 students daily about a month ago. I think it's increased slightly since then, since they've expanded it to other types of essential workers. So it's probably around 9,000 or higher right now. And we estimate that based on the, again, DOE news reports, on testimonies, and on, on the best information that we can find. The other big part of the DOE's transition to remote learning was how to make sure that students with disabilities were going to be continued to engage with at the appropriate levels. So students with disabilities, which we define and the DOE defines as students who have an IEP or an individualized education plan, uh, make up a significant percentage of the DOE's population. It's about 20% of students in DOE schools are students with an IEP. So what the DOE did for these students, and important to say this wasn't immediate, this happened slightly after the initial transition to remote, was, was that every student with an IEP was going to get a remote learning plan, plan or an RLP. And these remote learning plans uh, from the DOE, they said that special education and related services are recommended on the IEP will be provided through remote learning to continue to support child's, the child's progress towards IEP goals. And so all the things that are part of a child's IEP, right? The type of classrooms they can be in, the type of services they can get, whether it's speech therapy or physical therapy, um, all those things have to transition to remote. Now, some of those things are more conducive to remote learning than others, right? Like a speech, ther a speech therapist can remotely engage with a student and offer speech therapy. Physical therapy is a lot more complicated for students who maybe had a paraprofessional that they had been assigned in their IEP to have them, or a nurse or a medical assistive technology all those things are a lot harder to provide remotely. And so these remote learning plans were supposed to adapt IEPs to the remote environment. We'll talk a little bit more about issues with that a little bit later. Um, provided the idea behind developing these remote learning plans for students was that the providers who provide them, the school special education offices, who were supposed to engage with, with, the, with the parents and the, fa the families of the children, in telling them what services were going to be possible to provide and what kind of modifications they have to make to the IEPs. The idea was these remote learning plans, while maybe different from the full slate of services on the IEPs, were supposed to be developed in, in conjunction with the families. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And one of the other things that they did in terms of a reaction to their transition to remote learning was understanding the immense challenges that students were going to have with this period of remote learning was they created a new grading policy so this new grading policy, which you can see in the chart here, um, for the younger grades, for preschool grades, 3K and pre-K for four-year-olds, uh, there was really no change in, in grading policy because those students don't receive report cards or grades. In elementary school grades, kindergarten through fifth grade, students were either gonna get a meets standards, so a pass, or a needs improvement, which is you know, the equivalent of a fail, but in this case was the student needs improvement. And, in this case, if a student did get a needs improvement, the school has to document the specific areas where a student needs that improvement. In the older grades, in six through eight from middle school, students can receive a meet standards, a needs improvement, or a course in progress, an N or an NX. And the difference between those two is, well, needs improvement is, you know, didn't, didn't complete the things that the course needs. Course in progress is, is really an incomplete for the course, right? And this is really for students who had trouble doing the re remote engagement that's needed to, to, to finish the course. Similar in grades nine through 12, um, students, the existing grading scale applied, but there was no failing grades issued. Students would get a course in progress and then they would have the opportunity to make up that course later on. The addition with high school was that for students who did get a passing grade, they, a normal grading scale applied, so they could get an A, a B, a C, a D, those students could actually convert those grades into just a passing and it wouldn't affect their GPA. So that option was available for high school students as well. In addition to the changes in grading policy for the DOE, the New York State Board of Education 
provided exemptions for June and August Regents exams. So in grades seven through 12, students who were taking a Regents class that would normally culminate in an exam, as long as they pass that class, they can then graduate without that exam. And the graduation requirements usually attached to those Regents exam exams for students were exempted. The thing that we're still waiting on, and this goes into more ongoing issues, is for students over 21, right? There are a, a good amount of students in the DOE who have taken longer to graduate high school, but according to state law, once you're 21, you can't then keep on going to school. But of course, this period of remote learning is, was such a disruption to everyone's uh, educational progress that we're waiting to see what will happen to these students. And we, we still don't have guidance issued on if those students, even if they're over 21, can come back for at least one more year. So more to come on that. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna take over for a few slides. And I wanna say that, you know, in addition to providing childcare for parents on the front line of the pandemic, um, school closures really incited a panic around students who, who have come to rely on schools for food. Um, nearly 75% of the public school system, 1.1 million students qualify for free or reduced price meals and depend on the free breakfasts and lunches that have been provided by the DOE since 2017. Um, so on the left of the screen, you can see a map which shows the average daily population for the school lunch meals by school district. And prior to the pandemic, the DOE was providing around 600,000 lunches to students on a daily basis. So as part of this transition to remote, the DOE launched a grab-and-go meals program at what they called meal hubs um, to provide meals to children across the city. Um, and meal hubs are now available for all New Yorkers to utilize free breakfast and lunch across 400 sites citywide. And again, so many families rely on school for meals. So this was really the DOE's effort to keep some provision on food for the families that they serve. And over time, these meal hubs became a part of the city's effort to tackle hunger at this time. And you can move to the next slide, Daryl. Um, and now we're kind of pivoting into um, the ongoing issues and updates um, as it applies to you know, education in this time and remote learning. So after this transition to remote learning, there's still a lot of unknowns. Uh, measuring attendance and further measuring engagement during this time has been very difficult. So according to a DOE press release um, released last week, the agency tallied an average of 88% of students in pre-K through grade 12 having daily interactions um, in the week of May 18th to May 22nd. And so the DOE is seeking to measure attendance through this, what they call daily interactions. Um, but due to the wide array of teaching formats that have taken off during remote learning, it's really difficult to measure these daily interactions in one way across the board. So the DOE has left it up to each school to define what these daily interactions are. And some examples are, might include a submitted assignment, joining an online discussion, or having a student or parent's phone call or email response to a message. And the issue with this is that a lot of teachers have come out to say that the things that are being classified as daily interactions may actually be meaningless and not indicate class attendance, completed assignments, or engagements. engagement. Um, so for example, a text from a parent saying, my child isn't doing the work might count as a daily interaction. Um, and what this means for us is unfortunately, this lack of quality data means that we don't have any insight as to which areas of the city might be struggling most in terms of engagement in schools and to where additional supports will be most needed to re-engage those children. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, um, you know, these data, DOE data often informs our advocacy and in this time informs the scope on who remote learning reached and who it didn't. Um, and also worth mentioning is that the DOE are releasing these data through press release, um, which is not the typical format in which they release their data. Um, and so we, we have to wait for those releases to be put forth in order to get the latest. Um, another issue with the measuring attendance and data collection is live instruction. Um, the DOE doesn't have a good estimate of how many students are receiving live instruction from their teachers um, via webcam or for how long. Many parents have complained that their kids weren't receiving live instruction and were instead receiving worksheets via email, leaving the burden of teaching to fall on the shoulders of these caregivers. However, many challenges have occurred in this domain, including lack of resources among students, which Daryl spoke about, um, cybersecurity concerns, and lack of direction and training for you know, staff alike. Um, and multiple barriers like these have made it difficult for the DOE to take a one-size-fits-all approach on how teachers are engaging with their students. Um, and you can move on, Daryl. Thank you. And so as Daryl mentioned earlier, a particularly vulnerable student group during this transition are the students in temporary housing. 
In New York City, this represents one in 10 students. Um, one in 10 students is defined as homeless, which can mean that they're doubled up, living in shelter, or living unsheltered. Um, and for these students, the struggles in the education system before COVID-19 were immense. But, um, and before COVID-19, less than one third of New York's homeless students scored proficiently on state reading and math exams on average, which is, which is 20 percentage points lower than their peers who were not homeless. So when we think about the transition to remote, these students face added obstacles that have risen to the forefront of CCC's advocacy. Um, in addition, you know, these students have less access to devices in order to engage in the remote learning, to communicate with teachers, and to stay in touch with peers. But in addition to that, these students lack the space to do uh, the work that they need to for these students. The regional enrichment centers that we mentioned earlier, do provide an opportunity for these students to have space and guidance. However, um, at the current time, those students are not allowed to utilize the regional enri enrichment centers. The DOE claims that the state's executive order has their hands tied by only allowing um, the children of essential workers. And so students in temporary housing are not currently able to utilize the enrichment centers at this time. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Daryl to discuss the remote learning plans. Yeah, so another ongoing issue and update as I left off was about students with disabilities. So again, in developing these remote learning plans, these IEP changes that were supposed to be unique to the period of remote, if you're gonna start modifying how students with disabilities receive services, you have to do it with parent engagement. And so we heard a lot of reports from partners, from, from other advocates that families weren't really being properly engaged in terms of remote learning plans. And some of those remote, remote learning plans were curtailing the services that students could get, which is not fully legal. Um, so that was a big issue. We worked with the, with the department's uh, Office of Special Education and with allies and, and they were responsive. And I think a lot of those issues has, have been in, confronted since then, although there are s still things that we hear about. Some other issues that we heard with remote learning plans was that in terms of what the DOE thought was possible for a remote IEP, it wasn't actually appropriate for students' cognitive levels. So if a student is in the fifth grade but needs to be learning at a third grade level or get instruction at a third grade level to help them progress, they then weren't getting remote learning plans that were suitable to that. Um, and then as to Sophia's point, the no live instruction is a big issue it is for all students, especially for students with disabilities. If you're thinking with students who where screens could be a problem, where attention could be a problem, if they're not getting live instruction for any part of the day, let alone some of the day, um, then again, their, their um, progress could be really hampered with no live instruction. The other thing was it not just in, with students with disabilities where they're supposed to have their, their IEPs transition to remote, but every student with an IEP is is legally bound to have a reevaluation if they have an IEP, or if they're a student who is referred to get an IEP, they have to then have an evaluation. Both those things are in law mandated that those students need to receive. Because those students went to remote, it doesn't mean that they can stop receiving them. And so the DOE, um, again, we had to advocate, but the DOE had to make sure that students who were entitled to get evaluations for an IEP were getting a, a, a full evaluation with the appropriate people involved. And that student scheduled for a reevaluation of their IEP to see if the right services were being provided, if more services could be, if, if the students, if services could be taken back and the student could be progressed onto a different level, that those reevaluations were taking place. Um, and so that was another a big issue for students with disabilities that, again, we're continuing to monitor. A lot of this is about monitoring, hearing from families, bringing it to the DOE's intention and, and, the, and the DOE responding. But those were the issues with students with disabilities. And part of the biggest issue with this, and we touched on this earlier, is the data issue, right? In terms of monitoring the, the delivery of services for students with disabilities, in our normal environment, not in distance learning, there are a ser there's data that we can look at and that we can analyze, right? We can look at data of how many IEP evaluations have been timely, how many reevaluations have been timely, right? We can look at the DOE has to publish data on the percent of services that they've, that they've delivered to students. They have to publish data on the amount of students they're serving we're not getting those things right now. And so again, we're hearing these things anecdotally and they're, we're bringing them to the DOE's intention, but what we're not really have able to see is how many students are really being left out, how many students with disabilities are being left out, how many students with and other needy populations like students in temporary housing that Sophia was talking about. And so this is this ongoing data issue that I, I think eventually these things will become more clear, but it, it's something that still uh, in, informs the policy and advocacy. 
And in line with this, um, the DOE is implementing several ongoing surveys um, in order to collect data on various aspects of school life for the students. Um, one of these surveys is the remote learning survey. Um, so this is a survey specifically made for this current atmosphere meant to gather families experiences and needs as it relates to remote learning for students and their families through grades K through 12. Um, and there's a family survey and a student survey being administered in nine languages completely voluntary and ultimately these data will be shared in aggregate with the DOE and with schools to better understand the needs of the students that they're serving. Um, a second data collection effort is the school survey. So this is an annual survey that the DOE does um, and every single year parents, teachers, students, and some select support school staff take the school survey to understand so that schools can better understand which key members of their school communities think about the learning environment at their school. And the information that's captured by this survey is really designed to support a dialogue of, of, across, of members across the institution to figure out how to make the school a better place to learn. Um, and it's also used to produce the school quality reports, um, which folks might be familiar with. And now all this data collection is ongoing. All versions were, were put online as an intent to try and get this data collection done um, in the midst of COVID-19 and where the deadline was extended through the end of the school year to provide as much opportunity as possible for people to have their voices heard. And the, the last kind of um, you know, engagement effort coming from the DOE is the DOE is engaging with parents, school leaders, and others to collect ideas and perspectives on admissions to screened programs for fall 2021 through a series of virtual town hall meetings with the executive superintendents. Um, so it actually seems like their last event was yesterday, but they have recordings of their events available on their website alongside an explanation about admissions, screening, and how this is affected by COVID-19. But ultimately, these engagement events were meant to determine how to adjust admissions to screen programs since in the absence of state testing data, in the absence of attendance data, and in the absence of grading data. Um, and something worth mentioning and in kind of segues right along into the next slide is that these screens are typically used to decide who gets seats in, in schools um, for, for schools in which there are more applicants than seats. And the criteria are are known to systematically disadvantage certain groups, especially poor children and black and Latino children, um, which is, you know, something really worth addressing here. Remote learning is likely to exacerbate existing achievement gaps that we've known to exist before the pandemic. Um, so here we have a chart of the disparity in school outcomes of achievement for students of different racial groups. And these um, are three different measures of academic achievement, right? So math test scores, math proficiency, and graduation rates all represent different time points in the education continuum. And as a matter of fact, in this case, they all represent different students. But at all of these time points, we see that Black and Latino students fall behind their Asian and white peers. And um, uh, students in temporary housing, students with disabilities, and multi-language learners are other groups of students who are going to be facing added difficulty during this time in exacerbating achievement gaps that have existed prior to COVID-19. Um, and these gaps might widen because of disparities in access to computers and home internet connection and having space to do work in direct instruction from teachers. Um, but during this time of massive change, both due to COVID-19 and the fight against systematic racism, it's all the more important to have, in re to have a re-engaged discussion about these learning gaps and to account for the disparities that are going to widen them during this time. Um, I just wanna briefly summarize a, re, a recent New York Times article which highlighted some research which can now estimate the size of learning loss which students can experience under these conditions. Um, and just to briefly summarize some of the research that they presented, um, one of the work, a working paper from NWEA and scholars at Brown University and the University of Virginia found that the average student could begin the next school year having lost as much of a third of their expected progress from the previous year in reading and half of their expected progress in math. Other analysis show that this learning loss varies significantly based on socioeconomic status. An analysis from researchers at Brown and Harvard looked at how Zern, an online math program, was used by 800,000 students both before and after schools closed in March. They found that through late April, student progress in math decreased about half in classrooms located in low income zip codes, about a third in classrooms in middle income zip codes, and not at all in classrooms in high income zip codes. Further, 
The Center on Reinventing Public Education, a think tank, is going to release an analysis soon of uh, the pandemic learning policies of 477 school districts. They found that a fifth have required live teaching over video and that wealthy school districts were twice as likely to provide such teaching as low income districts. And so all to say that student and teacher resources have perhaps one of the largest impacts on this. Um, in fact, the, the Census Bureau is conducting a household pulse survey um, to try and produce data on the social and economic effects of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on American households. And findings from the most recent wave in May show that at the national level, parents with the lowest incomes are spending the same amount of time assisting their children with learning as parents in the highest income bracket. Um, and so support for these students will be needed in the fall, including content to review and catch up students, effective online learning implementation in the face of this continued intermittent closure, closures and increased social and emotional support from counselors to mitigate this impact of being in isolation while families experienced hardship, um, all in the midst of massive budget cuts, which I will leave to Daryl to discuss. Yeah, so in light of everything that Sophia just highlighted, the, the profound effects that this long period of distance learning could have on students, especially on students who already were, were seeing academic progress gaps, we have a, a pretty dire budget situation. Um, I apologize if this webinar is in any way uh, a, a bummer, but this is the situation. We just, we want it to be informative and also to inform advocacy so we can make it better. Um, but we, we know that this pandemic had really bad effects on the city budget. Uh, there, with the mayor was projecting a $6 billion budget gap. There's now more recent projections that between the lost tax revenue, that budget gap could be as high as nine or 10 billion. And so the mayor proposed a series of budget cuts across agencies, um, but the education department with its the largest budget of any agency and about a third of the city budget really saw uh, the lion's share of those cuts. And the reason we're highlighting these here in terms of this webinar about remote learning is because these are going to be the things that affect schools' ability to make up the learning losses that students are experiencing during this period. These are going to really make it harder for those schools to make up those losses. So these cuts include, um, they totaled for the next fiscal year $470 million. The biggest cut was to the fair student funding formula, which if you're not aware, is the main source of funding for individual school budgets. So this is a formula the, that devises how much money a school is set to get for the school year, and it's really given to principals so that they can use it at their discretion. So it can fund everything from more teachers, which is usually what principals use it for, is more staff, more counselors, more social workers. It can use, they can add, use it for resources. Um, a $100 million cut to that is really something that's harsh because it's going to directly affect the classroom. Um, and so we're very concerned about that cut, especially it, be, it being the biggest cut. We also saw big cuts in the area of professional development, $67 million in the next fiscal year. And that's after a series of cuts to professional development in the previous fiscal years too, as, as a, a savings area that the, the city and the DOE usually have, have in the past tried to take money from. We also saw a big cut, $54 million to equity and excellence programs. So these were programs that that the, the mayor, this kind of standalone programs that the mayor championed as, as education initiatives that included various things. They included things like, that might sound familiar, like college access for all, algebra for all, the single shepherd programs. So these were programs that had separate funding streams to do very specific things. College access for all was about getting more college counselors to give kit to, for kids to access, get, getting more college counselors in schools, getting kids to college campuses, um, and really just improving a college attendance rate. Um, single Shepherd was a program to have single counselors and guidance counselors and social workers assigned one-on-one -on -one to students um, in certain districts. And uh, those programs, since they had these small funding streams, uh, were, were nixed in terms of these budget cuts. Um, there's also a system-wide hiring freeze that results in $47.7 million worth of savings. They um, took a lot of money by delaying a planned exp expansion to 3K in four districts. So that's the universal pre-K for three-year-olds. It was supposed to expand to the Lower East Side, to East Tremont in the Bronx, to Greenpoint, Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and to Rosedale, St. Albans in Queens. That's not going to happen in the fall as planned. That's a $44 million cut. And there's another $40 million cut in school allocation memos. So I mentioned that the main source of funding for schools is the fair student funding formula that does make up the majority of school individual school budgets. But there's also a lot of funding goes to schools in the form of these SAMs or school allocation memos. 
Um, and those, again, it could be for specific things. There could be school allocation memos for guidance counselors. There could be school allocation memos for, you know, better math instruction. Um, those are specific allocation memos that they're taking $40 million from have not been named yet. So it's hard to say exactly what those things will affect, but it is fair to say that those things, again, will affect schools, will affect the classroom. They're not administrative savings. Those are classroom savings. In addition to these cuts, it was outside the DOE, but I, I think it's worth mentioning that something CCC is very engaged in is that the budget cut all summer youth programs. So that's Compass, Sonic, Beacon, and Cornerstone programs. Those are in the, the Department of Youth and Community Development budget, DYCD, and the Summer Youth Employment Program. And the reason I just mention it here is because those programs have historically provided um, academic enrichment opportunities over th the summer to kids and have really helped combat learning loss. Um, and those are programs that are free and that they're widely used. We estimate that cutting all those programs, including SYUP and all those summer camps, is going to leave about 175,000 kids without any type of options for the summer. And again, when we're talking about the possibility of remote learning to exacerbate uh, learning loss and achievement gaps without these programs to help counterbalance them, it could be even worse. And so all of these things are going to make it harder to support students in the fall. Which brings us to the fall. So there's a lot that we don't know, which we will, we will explain. We can talk a little bit about what we do know. What we do know is that before the fall, they have made an announcement about summer school. So summer school will be remote. Um, and this year, 178,000 students will be invited to participate in summer school, which is the same students who, if we look at the grading policy, are the ones who received courses in progress or needs improvement grades. And this is their opportunity to make up those courses. So it's still going to be remote. Something to keep in mind is that the usual summer school model for the DOE is that, you know, students who have to go to a summer school class aren't going to have the same math teacher that they had during the school year. Um, that's important for remote because it means that we're again putting them in a different environment for students who weren't maybe successfully engaging in a distance learning environment before. Now we're putting them in another distance learning environment, except with new, a new teacher, hopefully live instruction, but we don't know. And on that note, um, there was a recent development that they would, the DOE would require some live instruction during summer school. So we know at least kids will get some live instruction um, is, is now mandated. Um, in terms of how much, it still is unclear, but they're supposed to get some live instruction for summer school. The things for the fall that we don't know, right, is if schools will reopen, if they're, they're going to reopen as we know them, right? So a lot of things have been suggested. Uh, staggered classes would be one option where if the students are on a different schedule, you don't have the entire student body in the school at one time, making it less crowded and more easily socially distant. Um, there's hybrid scheduling, which is, you know, some classes may lend themselves to online tutoring, some may not. And, and how can we make it so that some students are we're learning online, some are in the school, and that hybrid, again, makes the school building less crowded, more socially distant. And could it be depending on grade level? If you have seniors taking classes that are easier to be remote, if you have seniors taking less important classes, maybe just a phys ed or an, or an elective class that they need to graduate, could those students really only be required to come to school sometimes while the younger grades are, are coming more often? And so all those things are things that we've thrown out there that, that I think principals in the DOE are engaging with right now, but still there is no set plan for what's gonna happen in the fall. These are just things that are being talked about. What we've heard in terms of the fall um, the chancellor at a recent uh, city budget hearing testified, he said he thought there were a 50-50 chance that schools reopen. So that's not helpful at all, but a 50-50 chance, you know, it means that he knows as much as we do. Um, the governor in these reopening phases of which New York City just entered the first phase, schools, day camps, child care centers, those things are all in the fourth phase. Um, so in these terms of these reopening phases schedule, every phase is supposed to last two weeks, um, but it easily could last longer. It has to last at minimum two weeks. So if you did do two weeks, you would have schools reopening in the fall, but uh, the, even the mayor has announced he doesn't anticipate being in phase two in two weeks. He thinks it would, wouldn't be till July. Um, so again, it's unclear, but we do know that schools are in the fourth phase. And what we've also heard uh, across groups, right, we've heard from the teachers union and principals union, we've heard from teachers themselves who are concerned, and of course of the parents, is that safety comes first, right? So in terms of what the DOE decides to do, in terms of how they get kids to school, whether schools are entirely remote, partially, or fully in person, um, it really is about safety. Parents aren't going to feel comfortable bringing their kids to school if there isn't a plan in place. Teachers aren't going to feel comfortable sending them to school. Unions aren't going to be okay sending their staff to school. Um, if those those environments aren't considered safe and aren't considered a, a high risk environment. So those things are what we've heard and what we're going to continue to hear. And, and those are the updates we have in terms of school in the fall. 
So we'll end here just with, 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 with what CCC has been doing in terms of advocacy in these areas and others. Uh, so I mentioned the cut to youth services. CCC has been very engaged in this fight um, with, in partnership with uh, other organizations and the Campaign for Children. The reason this is so important, we think, to school in the fall is because the reasons I mentioned earlier, there's going to be 178,000 kids in summer school. A lot of those children are receiving after school virtual programming right now. This, those things are going to stop June 30th, right, unless, that, unless there's some type of restorative funding for youth services. So it's really about a continuation and supporting those students in summer school. It's also, like I said, about um, combating learning loss. So much of kids in summer camp are getting academic enrichment opportunities um, that are fun and engaging for them, whether they're virtual or not. Um, and the effects of not having those, especially after these months of remote learning that we know are gonna exacerbate achievement gaps, um, could the uh, impact could be profound. So we're really advocating on the youth services front to try to get a partial restoration of those programs. Um, we're doing that in conjunction with the Campaign for Children. Uh, we have a hashtag to please use on social media if you're active on social media and want to support this effort, hashtag FundYouthNYC. Some good news, very recently on Sunday, the mayor announced that he was going to be shifting funding from the NYPD's budget to youth services and social services. We don't have more details on that, so it's unclear if that's gonna fund directly the summer programs that were cut. Um, we hope it does. We hope it funds the summer youth employment program as well. Um, he also said it would fund social services. Those things could possibly be involved in the DOE. It couldn't include mental health in the DOE. It could include social workers in DOE schools. So it's still unclear how that funding is gonna go, but um, we're excited to see some of the other things that that, that funding could support. One thing that CCC has also been, been vocal about is the cuts to the fair student funding formula. So we know it's a terrible budget year. And, and as we saw, there's a host of cuts to education and a lot of them are harmful. But if there's one more harmful than the others, it might be this one, right? It might be this $100 million cut to the fair student funding formula, which directly takes money out of principal's hands, out of school budgets, could have direct implications in class size, in teachers, in, in services provided, in resources for a school. Um, and in the experience of students when they go to school, especially students who are coming back from what's going to be a, a, a rough end of spring, a rough summer, and hopefully not a rough fall. Um, so we've advocated a lot about really trying to limit the cuts to FSF as much as possible. We also advocated uh, in city council testimony um, and multiple hearings for investments where possible to vulnerable student groups that we know are going to be adversely affected by the remote learning environment. Um, now, we would love to advocate for large investments, but understanding the budget situation, we advocated for things that we think are affordable or are no cost that make a big difference. So for example, multilingual learners who we know are a group that already had um, a, a significant achievement gap in terms of their educational outcomes and are we're going to be adversely affected by remote learning because they might have parents who might not have the English proficiency that could guide them along with remote learning. Also with limited live instruction, it's so hard to learn another language. Um, a pilot program for multilingual, multilingual learners who are older, um, who also could be at risk of aging out, helping those students get back into the system and get engaged. Um, we advocated for students in foster care who have always struggled in terms of their transportation and required transportation to city schools. We advocated for what is possibly a no-cost solution, which is having just well, at least one staff member in the DOE who is dedicated entirely to students in foster care, of which there isn't right now. And something we've always advocated for is there's a lot of stu students, preschoolers who require special education classrooms who don't have classrooms right now. And this period of remote learning means that while they were sitting out to wait, they might not even have a classroom to go back to. And so we advocate always to provide a seat to every preschool special ed um, student who is who needs one. And on the the kind of short-term issue, these are all kind of things that we're advocating for for the fall, the short-term advocacy about students in temporary housing that Sophia talked about, we're really just trying to keep a drumbeat there and apply pressure. Um, we've submitted letters along with many partners. We've wrote a blog on the issue. We've done a lot of social media days on the issue. It's really just about let's open up these recs to these students, right? If right now there's nothing stopping the DOE from giving students in temporary housing access to the recs based on the fact that they're students in temporary housing alone. Um, and so we want to keep the pressure on um, council members, council member Mark Traeger, the chair of education, the comptroller, the speaker, they've all submitted letters on the issue to the DOE. And so we think keeping pressure on, having them open up to students for the end of the school year or possibly over the summer um, is gonna be hopefully something we can get done. And with that, we have 10 minutes left. I'd love to start taking questions. Uh, I'm going to start answering them from the Q&A. Um, 
Carlos, if you see someone raising their hand or something I haven't addressed, please feel free to, to jump in. But I'm gonna yeah. get started with. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say really quickly to everyone that yep. uh, if you'd like to answer live instead of type a question in the Q&A box, you'll see it at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu that says raise hand. Um, I'll um, unmute you and uh, let you know um, when you're up so that way you can speak uh, and for anyone who's joining us via telephone, uh, I'm unmuting you right now. Um, just let us know um, when you'd like to uh, ask a question. And if you have some background noise, can you just please just mute yourself and then unmute yourself when you have a question you'd like to ask. Um, and then lastly, we did answer a number of questions uh, are in the Q&A box. You'll see them under the answer tab. Um, but for those, and I believe specifically to Kendall, Stella, and Colin, uh, if you have a further question that um, needs more elaboration, um, please just let us know. Uh, yeah, I'll let Daryl start now. Thanks. So I'm gonna start with just the questions I see in the Q&A, um, and then I'll try to see if there's any in the chat I missed. Um, and Carlos, please let me know if there's anything else or if someone's raising their hand. Um, I see Kendall asked, how was the original number of devices, 300,000 determined and who's holding the data on those devices um, that have been delivered and still need to be delivered? Great questions, Kendall. Um, the original need, 300,000, what we're told, right? Everything here is we're told. We're told was determined by surveys to schools. But they, they sent surveys to principals to say, you know, in terms of data you have on your students, or if you want to ass assess your own survey, go ahead, but how many devices do you think you need? And then those were, were combined into an estimate of 300,000. And then who's holding the data in terms of how many devices have been delivered and still need to be delivered? It's the DOE. Um, the only ones that they know, the, they tell us how many have been delivered, not through regular data releases or press releases, which would be helpful, but the numbers we gave you, the 290,000 number, was from a, uh, a council hearing that we just, I, I tuned into and was writing down information as they, as they unveiled it. Um, and they're, they're in terms of estimates still need to be delivered is just based on 300,000 minus what they know they've delivered. Um, again, there could be a need that is much more vast than that. Um, was there anything you wanted to add there, Sophia? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, is there a map of the original regional enrichment centers and which ones were closed? Again, great question. No, um, there, initially there was a map, um, but that it was like a Google map and I was, I was holding onto it for dear life and widely circulating it, but then it was taken down. Uh, I don't have specific information on which ones were closed. And I don't think the Dewey's released that either. Um, I think that going into the summer, we're hopefully going to have an, um, before we go into the summer, it, it, the recs are staying open, and so we'll have a, an updated list of which ones are staying open for the summer. We can answer that question then. But again, this speaks to the issue of just not having the exact data. Um, is there data on which of the 13 categories for IEPs are prevalent in which areas? Uh, so I, I assume by categories, you mean the, like disability classifications. Uh, let me know, like raise your hand if, I, if, if, I, if I'm incorrect in interpreting that. Um, but is there data on which of the disability classifications are prevalent in which areas? So, Sophia, feel free to jump in here. I, I do know that there is public data on, in total, students across the system broke their IEPs broken down by disability classification. Does that then go district wide? Sophia, do you know that? I don't know of any data source which breaks down the the IEP classifications further by district. I mm -hmm. only know that there's district wide data of students that have IEPs, but I would I don't know at this point if it goes as granular as having both. Yeah, um, but we would be happy to do, Kendall, is I, I believe that information is public on the Dewey's website and we can, you can always email us, our emails are here, and we can definitely send you where to access that information, at least in terms of disability classification system-wide. Yeah, um, and then I would just also love to answer another one of Kendall's questions really quickly. Um, I, I can't find it. But I, I know that you had asked about how is proficiency defined for math, the math test scores. Um, and that is students were deemed proficient if they score a 65 or higher on the Regents exam. Um, and so that is that definition. And I believe your second question was how do you justify these gaps? And on a personal note, I really, I cannot, and I, I don't even know how to respond. So I'm, I'm sorry there. Um, yeah, so that was the, that, 
that was Kendall's second question. We have a question from Crystal. How many students are not getting every service on, I, I believe, our IEP is what you meant. Um, that's a great question. We have those numbers during the during not remote learning, right? There's a the DOE releases percentages of 80%, 90% of students are getting this percentage of students of, of services on their IEP. Again, it's one of the big issues of we don't know how many students with disabilities are being left out. We don't know it, overall system wide what percentage of services on a remote learning plan are the services that they should be getting. Um, so it's a great question, and I think it speaks to absolutely what the gaps are going to be coming out of this, right? Once these numbers are made, it's going to be a lot more visible, the, the problems of remote learning once these numbers are made public, but we don't know the sense of that. I think what we know anecdotally um, is that there are still students who are not getting the services they need. Uh, is there any research on potential COVID-19 rates at the enrichment centers? That would be a great question. I, I, I really doubt it. Sophia, would you know of anything that might help that? I doubt it, right? Um, I don't know of any. I know that at first DOE was providing some updates on staff which have which were um, testing positive for COVID-19 and or were were passed due to COVID-19 um, on their coronavirus updates page staff information. However, the past few days that link has been broken and so I, I don't know what else might live on there um, in terms of that kind of reporting. Mm -hmm. Um, how does the number of students in summer school this year compare to previous summers? Good question. Um, off the top of my head, although don't hold me to these numbers, it's a lot more, obviously. It's, like we said, it's 178,000 this year. I believe in previous summers, it's around 50,000. Um, it's slightly more if you incorporate students who are taking optional summer classes, like electives they want to take and that kind of thing. But in terms of mandated summer school, it's a lot more, um, almost three times more, or more than three times more. Uh, but so this, it's a significant increase and we didn't think it's obvious that that's because of the lack of engagement in remote learning. Um, have teachers received instruction on how to effectively teach online? Is that training ongoing during this distance learning? Shock to hear, it seems many teachers are not doing any online teaching, like not doing any live instruction, yeah. Um, that is one of the biggest issues that's coming to the forefront now is the lack of live instruction and it's why summer school live instruction was mandated. In terms of teachers having received instruction on how to effectively teach online, I think that uh, uh, a lot of it's been up to the schools. I think schools have engaged a lot uh, in terms of doing training of teachers and what they're supposed to do. I think system-wide for teachers, there's been a lack of it. I think there, there has been some system-wide coordination in, like in the early childhood realm. So if you go on the like DOE's early childhood site, you'll see a lot of activities and options for preschoolers for four-year-olds and three-year-olds at home do engaging remote learning on things to do there. But in terms of system-wide for all teachers, I think there's been a lack of it. I think it's been very much up to individual schools in terms of getting everyone on the same page and how to remote teach. And I think that's why there's probably been a lack of live instruction. How is the city's plan to reopen office worker for office workers um, expected to impact children this summer who don't have summer program options? Janelle, I agree. This is our, 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 one of our biggest advocacy points in terms of advocating for, for the youth, right? For the youth services programs. If the city's reopening, of which we started to, to, to yesterday, right? And we continue to reopen if the numbers stay low, um, right? Then you have parents who are looking to get back to work and you have parents who maybe were laid off and looking to find a job. And if those kids don't have summer programming options, affordable summer programming options, how do we expect the economy to start up again if we don't have those youth services? We've tried to really emphasize this to the city council, to the mayor. Um, I think his, um, his willingness to then shift funding to youth services from the NYPD budget is somewhat of a recognition of those concerns. Um, what we've mostly heard from the mayor on this issue, and to be fair, these were his responses before Sunday, before he said he'd shift mud funding to youth services, were that he just didn't think summer camps and summer youth employment were possible given social distancing, and, and we disagreed, right? And us and providers were trying to emphasize that they were currently providing them and that even virtual programming was important, right, for exactly the reasons you identified. Um, so it's a point we're trying to get across. Um, how are the devices sourced? How are they delivered to the child? Um, a lot of devices, so devices at schools, um, and if anyone else has more specifics here, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, devices in schools were available for pickup for parents. Um, the, if the DOE was sending devices in mass, like to a shelter or to a public housing complex, like we mentioned, those were usually shipped. Um, and 
I believe it was the other question was how they were sourced. Um, I mentioned that the DOE was giving out its current inventory of laptops, which they have in schools, and then the data enabled iPads were sourced from Apple. Have there been any savings from lack of services or busing that can be used and any initiatives or money from the state that can present any different data standards or hope? I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're asking for, for hope. Um, I have some bad news, Nancy, in terms of the hope, in at least in one of these areas, and that the state funding was part of the reason that we're in this bind. Um, the state, in, 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 their, in these past state budget, again, not so this isn't presented budget like the city that we're negotiating now, but the budget that was enacted, um, the state kept funding for education entirely flat. Um, and while that does is not as bad as a cut, it is pretty harmful because education costs always increase, right? Teacher salaries always increase. Numbers of students who are multilingual learners, students with disabilities, um, those populations are, are usually increasing. And so it would cost more to educate a kid every year, but so flat increasing from the state is, was a really hard thing for the city. The other hard thing for the city was that the state received money from the, and this maybe goes to another part of your question, we did receive money from the federal government in terms of the education funding, and they took that money and they just filled the, a budget gap with it. So they cut the same amount of money from state education funds and they filled it in with federal funds. And so um, what that did was uh, it, it made it so the state then was giving the city even less money than they thought they'd get. And so not a lot of hope from the state. I think there is hope on the side from um, the federal government. I think what, what, the state and the city are hoping for is a federal, more federal aid to come straight to the schools this time and not through the state that would hopefully counteract some of the savings we talked about. Is there data on the location, relocation movement of students by zip code based on the, asking based on the assumption that some students have families with greater mobility and support, their outcomes may be less adversely impacted by remote learning due to COVID-19? Sophia, what do you think? I don't know of such a day. And I think that's such a great question um, and, a, and a really great assumption, um, Janelle. And I don't believe that there is data on that. And it is worth mentioning that our data, right, and the DOE's data does represent the school in which the student is attending, not the community or the district in which they necessarily live, because we know that not all students are going to their zone schools. Um, and so that is a great point. And I'm sorry, I don't have an, a better answer for you. Um, how do charter schools fit into the data you presented? Um, so, so in Darryl, terms of, um, yeah. sorry for interrupting, but this question um, was also entered in the chat box, and there was it was a bit longer. So they were also asking if the data presented represents charter schools as well. And then another question with that on what role charter schools play in um, helping through this crisis in the next year that might be different from other types of schools. So in terms of the data presented, uh, Sophia, these, when we talk about the achievement gaps, do you, do you know how charter schools fit into these? Um, I believe that charters are included. Uh, oh, the, within the test score data, I actually don't believe that the, te the, that the charter schools are included. Um, we do on our, our database have some breakdowns for test scores for uh, traditional public school versus charter school, um, but they're not automatically included, no. And in terms of, I'm trying to think of the, any of the other data we indicated. Um, in terms of students in temporary housing, yeah. that including um, charter school students, yeah. um, yes, but otherwise, no. And I think the lunch data and the IEP data also includes charter schools, correct? I'm, I'm not sure offhand, off the back of my head. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll add just the numbers for device delivery. Initially, the DOE said they weren't going to be responsible for delivering students, um, devices to students in charter schools, um, but then they, they did go back on that. And so students who need, who are charter school students could fill out the survey and request a device and get one. So and in the end, the, the numbers that the DOE is giving us can include students in charter school who needed a device. Although again, the charter schools on their own also had probably their own methods of device delivery. Um, do you have more information on who donated devices? Uh, I don't, other than Apple, I know made some donations, but I, that's something that we can look into. Um, if you want to go ahead and email me or Sophia that question, we can, I can definitely try to put together some new sources and send you if, you're, if it's something you're interested in who was possibly involved in donations. I know Apple is one, but I have to look into the others. 
Um, so we have um, another question uh, in the chat box from Stella uh, asking about funding for dual language programs and if they have been or will be affected by the budget cuts. So that's a great question. Um, so it really depends, right? The fair student funding cuts that we're seeing is really a cut to an individual school's budget. So in the fall, a principal, instead of having X money to work with, is going to have Y money to work with. So how they make that work could affect any areas at their discretion. Does that mean that they don't hire another bilingual educator when they think they need one? Like, yes, right? And so that could affect dual language programs. The other way it could affect dual language programs is the school allocation memos. So again, those are unnamed right now. Um, but if there's a certain school allocation memo that is specifically this much money goes to schools based, you know, to help support English language instruction um, and that is cut in any amount, then yes, that affects dual language programs too. Um, it's part of the reason that we advocate for multilingual learners as a vulnerable student population because we know that they're the ones who need more support. We know that smaller class sizes, they help all students, they really help them. We know live instruction is really helping them. And so um, while there's no specific cut, Two dual language programs, those two things I mentioned, yes, could affect dual language programs. So I haven't seen anyone raise their hand um, so that way they can ask a question live. Um, if that's not true, please raise your hand again or type in the chat box that you'd like to speak. I also unmuted phone numbers who dialed in. So if you have a question, um, please uh, ask away right now. Okay, well, we have our emails here, so please feel free to follow up to you can follow up with us directly if you have any other questions. Um, we'll also be following up by sending out a PDF of the slides and this and the recording of the webinar. Um, and you can also respond to that email if you have any questions or follow up. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining today and uh, we hope to see you soon at more CCC events. Thanks everyone. Take care.